I want to invite all of the speakers, everybody, uh, all the speakers to the to the stage, and we'll take first questions for the last three, the panel, just in the interest of equity, um, and then we'll we'll move to a more general discussion to to conclude the day's program. Yes. I always ask for a question. You can't ask a question. You've got to come up to the stage. You're part of the thing. I don't like your rules. Okay. Too bad. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 Also, if we could, can we get the, the handheld microphones and can we get a light on the stage, please? Okay, the mic, the handheld mics for the panel are coming, and if there's a question from the audience, yes. Can you speak into the mic? It's not on yet. It's from the back. Yeah. <laughs> While we're filling time, the one thing, just to pick up on one point from Jennifer's talk. Um, what some of you may not know is that Walt Whitman, who in many ways was a, the presiding spirit of this exhibition, was a nurse in this building when it was a hospital. Um, and one of the alternative titles that we considered before Heidseek was from the Walt Whitman poem, I Lift the Veil. Mm -hmm. And now I think we, do we have power? Yes. It's not been a good week for infrastructure in Washington. Well, why don't you shout out your question and I'll repeat it. Jennifer, I want to thank you for saying that we shouldn't apologize for David's work. I think that's a very important statement for you to make. I also want to thank you for screening that film for everyone and bringing his imagery you know, to the fore of this presentation. And I don't really have a question, but what I do want to say is in this discourse that's um, happening around this act of censorship, I've taken it as an opportunity to continue to put David's work out there. And so when the LA Times uh, announced that David Gergen was going to be advising the Board of Regents, I took that as an opportunity to respond in the comments field. And one of the items that I put in the comments field was cut and pasted from ACT UP New York, and it's David Warnerovich died of AIDS. So I'm taking this moment to get his beliefs, his ideas out there, and I encourage everybody else to do that too. Thank you. And now, questions. First, anybody for the last three speakers, and then we'll go to a general discussion. Yes. Sure, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, this is a question for David Getze, um, who showed us, I think, quite remarkably that um, the most simple, straightforward slabs of rock can, in fact, be riddled with, um, you know, uh, the most unexpected uh, uh, queer uh, conjunctions of, of bodies and, and, and uh, sculpture. My question is really about um, the problem of biography uh, or the challenge of biography, which I know has been um, on the table today already, um, as it of course, would be, um, given our topic. And I, the question is, to what extent um, n our knowledge of Scott Burton's um, commitment to, to sort of a very specific s &M sort of queer politics and a desire to um, have that be part of a public, uh, public space and public debate is necessarily part of your en one's encounter in the present with these sculptures. And this question really came um, for me out of the pictures of that bronze chair um, outside 
of that first uh, exhibition. And it struck me that watching those people try to pick that chair up wasn't really about self-abnegation. It was kind of cruel, right? I mean, it's a little bit like the dollar bill glued to the, to the street um, in that way. And that made me wonder about the whole premise of self-abnegation at all. Um, to what extent making monumental stone sculpture, I mean, it's a beautifully perverse argument you're making, to what extent that could be um, self-abnegation at all. And then the flip side of that, um, to what extent do you see this sculpture sort of predetermining the encounter on the other side? Your students leap up as if electrified, but they sit back down. Um, we're complicit, but how complicit? Um, are these necessarily um, s and objects? Um, in their in their present and future. Well, no, I mean, is this on? Yeah, okay. I think um, this gets us back to the conversation in the earlier panel, which is crucial, which is that um, one of the things that I'm really interested in in this work, and this is also about my book about Rodin, about um, the marking of straight masculinity at the um, turn, of this, turn of the century, um, is about the ways in which artists use sexuality as a resource for developing um, otherwise public modes of, um, of sociality and practice. And um, I, I don't think it's necessary for us to know about the, I'm gonna answer your three questions, there are three embedded questions, I'm gonna do it backwards. Um, uh, it's, I don't think it's necessary for us to know this, and these are not s and objects. That is the particular um, confluence of biography and art theory um, and agenda that blended together in order for him to arrive at works that um, have been, for instance, denigrated by the October crowd as being complicit in corporate. Right, so how does one get to a style or a mode of practice? Um, in, a, in a paper like this, it tends to, um, you know, when I make the, these claims, it one uh, can forget that this is, you know, one component of that, of that practice. But I think it's a, the crucial one, and I would put myself in line with um, how Jonathan talked about um, Martin's work, is that it's, it's the crucial resource, the, the crucial thing that helps develop this out. Um, and so that's the answer to, the, I think, the third question, which is how complicit are we? I mean, I think, um, I think part of the, what's interesting about Burton's work is that we don't need to know this. It actually would be counterproductive to some of his other goals, for instance, financial stability and, and, and public commissions for people to know this, right? Um, and this is um, sort of interesting. So I think there's, it's, I'm trying to uncover some of the private origins and meanings of the work for him. Um, it, and as part of a kind of queer reading, I mean, I came into these and always have been interested in Burton because of the kind of crazy intimacies that happened between you and a sculpture. And, um, you know, with um, with these chairs and benches. And there was something sort of lingeringly queer about this all from, uh, I mean, the bronze chair is my, like, muse. I first encountered it as an undergraduate at Oberlin College, and, 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 it was the, and it was the only work of art that was exhibited on the day without art, spotlit in the center of the courtyard, empty, um, and it was incredibly poetic, and ever since then I've been in love with that chair. And um, I've been trying to figure out why I th always thought it was so interesting, and I, and I didn't know anything about Burton for the longest time, all of what I showed you is the result of um, the opening of the Burton Archives at the Museum of Modern Art and a bunch of oral history interviews and everything. And so it's not like I took the biography and then I actually had the hunch, you know, and I, I work on Victorian homoeroticism too and there's a lot of hunches there. Um, and, but it, you know, you have to just kind of own it and, and follow it. Um, and sorry, I'll, I'll wrap up in just a sec. So that's to get to uh, that, that it's the larger it's not the only meaning, but I think what's interesting is that it's the ways in which a kind of queer position is used to generate new ideas that may end up looking like something else, but are kind of fascinating. Um, biography, I'll just answer it quickly. I'm very anxious about using biographical material. I'm emboldened by the fact that, um, that um, there's a published interview with The Advocate. There's explicit work that actually connects these biographical components. This is not sort of a private thing. Um, so, so in other words, it's not that I'm reading the public through the private, but I'm actually finding these modes of interface. I mean, putting a fisting dildo into um, a 1976 exhibition is a 
pretty clear move. <laughs> You know, like, um, and, and spelling it out underneath and putting in the catalog that it's um, about homosexual liberation. So, so there's not a real lot of subtlety in that work from the mid-70s. And I'm using that to, uh, to authorize my use of biography. I, I have a um, qu question just that, that might open up something. Well, Suresh, you yeah, might, right. That might, might open it, because it's something I've been thinking a lot about. I, I think, and just wondering how it would play also with some of these other ideas, which is, it, it strikes me as interesting that the author of, uh, you know, of, of what is an author and the death of the author, those two authors, Foucault and, and, and Barth, are both, were both queer. And, the, and Foucault was very, very involved with S&M. And, and I I've wondered what to make of that, you know, particularly, in, and I wondered if people had responses to that in terms of, of how, how one thinks about that, because here you have these two very important queer thinkers who in certain ways are questioning the whole relationship of biography and authorship, et cetera, et cetera, and how, how that might work in, this, in, this, in, your, in your work, I guess. I, it's an important connection. The longer bit has a little bit more about Foucault and, um, and S&M in the 70s, and it, it's the crucial context. Um, and it's about this sort of the experience of the closet, the, you know, this classic Sedgwick formation, the epistemology of the closet is that there's always an alienation between surface and depth that um, becomes the site of uh, reimagining and, and critical mode. Um, so I think that's kind of crucial. And I just have one final comment for Sarah, which is, um, again, in the longer one, it, there, there's, a, there's a also a degree of aggressiveness in his work, like, you know, like a good S&M practice, it's a two-way street. Um, and so the, um, the sort of self-abnegation of the works is matched by a certain um, obsessiveness to their production, a grandeur of scale, an impossibility of movement, an institutional uh, requirement to take care of it and to deal with the public. I mean, so there's, um, you know, th they're not just sort of being kicked around and, and pushed away, they're pushing back. So um, the longer version talks about a certain passive aggressiveness in all of this too, which is, but I have 30 minutes and I'm using too much time now. The only things I just didn't feel like any, I, I didn't really just mean that question for you, I, I know, meant it we're more. We're doing the, okay. first the, the three right. people and then we'll Oh, okay, all right, all right. So I thought you would answer it. Yeah. Okay. That's right, okay, yeah. Well, I just, I really appreciate your talk, Jennifer. Not only are you bringing important works to us, um, I also really appreciate your legitimization of emotion and passion as someone who has cried in front of a lot of works and think that's really appropriate in many ways. I want to say, though, um, that when we talk about American culture, there, and 19th century American culture, um, there is still this tendency to compress 19th century American culture, 18th century American culture, into dominant Protestant white culture. And there are different modes of mourning. What was customary practice with post-mortem photographs and, and locks of hair for Protestant would not be for Catholic. For, I think also, um, I'm thinking, I was speaking with Nathan Siegel before that this year, um, March 25th is the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, which is now an NYU, yet another NYU building, their art gallery, and that on that day, 146 women, almost all under the age of 20, immigrant majority Jewish and Italian were trapped in a garment factory and had a leap to their death or were burned, and the newspapers at that time, 146 people died. Everyone knew each other from the block, and the newspapers are criticizing the outpouring open grief and saying these are those hysterical Jewish people, those hysterical Italian Catholics, and there's a submersion, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but that we still, that, that, that the mode is still to be unemotional, to be distant, to observe, to hold back, to repress. And I think um, that is something 
we just have to be aware of that's it. <laughs> Yeah, in, um, in the book, I very specifically use an opposition or a contrast is probably the more proper way because she's not setting up an absolute boundary. Um, of Franny Noodleman in her writing about the very specific reaction of the public to uh, um, public display of the Civil War photographs. And it's a, a very, very productive um, conversation about the contrast between um, the, uh, um, this kind of public circulation of images of war dead in contrast to um, private, domestic, and sentimental practices um, of post-mortem photographs. It's a very specific discussion. That said, mm -hmm. the book is actually very spe specifically meant to um, um, pressure and examine the ascribing of excess emotion to other bodies, be they queer, female, or of color. Um, and that's actually a very important part of the book because the artists that I'm working with are actually react are working with the problem of being an artist who, for example, in the case of Carrie Mae Weems and James Luna, are making work from a position which is expected to do a kind of emotional work for the nation. Right? So the figure of the Native American allows um, 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 America to mourn the very people it um, imagines as having annihilated and erased from existence. Right? Um, and uh, likewise for Carrie Mae Weems, it's a black woman who gives America permission to kind of work through its guilt and shame about um, slavery and ongoing um, practice, of ra practice of racism, right? So the expectation is that um, artists of color especially will be doing an affective labor um, on a cultural level, which is actually happening and being staged around emotion. And what I have found actually very frustrating in conversations about emotion within art history, for example, um, James Elkins is actually, I love actually his writing about emotion in art history. However, Pictures and Tears, which is one of the first places I started reading, there's no account in there for talking about emotion as a critical practice. Um, and he quite specifically, he's actually kind of come, come to a different place in his writing on this topic since the publication of that book. But in that book, he op opposes the work of the historian right, to the emotional reactions that he would have to art at, at first. So he'd be like, first I see something, I emote, right? I have this strong attachment to it, and then I treat it as a historian, and by the end, there's no feeling left. He quite literally describes the process that way. He also describes one spectator going to the Musée d'Orsay, a graduate student, telling him she went to the Musée d'Orsay and saw all of these grand imperialist fantasies, basically, and burst into tears and had to leave the museum. And he described that as, a, as an intellectual breakdown, like as a critical failure. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, so that's what really got me set on this road, was actually the, the strange and contradictory place of emotion within art historical practice, because of course it lies at the center of all of our fantasies about the artist. Right, as this um, Amelia Jones puts it, the exaggerated subjectivity of the artist, right, the sort of Im notion of the artist as feeling more, um, um, and often that actually seems like in Warner Robich's case, uh, there's an argue you can argue he does, <laughs> you know, that um, there's an incredible emotional density to his work that predates the um, um, the moment when the AIDS crisis really takes over his work, um, um, as an emotional and affective density to it, which is very much part of the practice. So I'm just trying to find a way to to write to honor that. Um, um, and uh, it's been a real challenge. I'm gonna say, Ron Athey's work for me has, is, act, is, is as complicated in terms of affect, in terms of the people, you talk, describe his work and you can just see, like, to talk about disgust, right, just take over people's reaction to the idea of it, and yet very, very few people will have seen it because you know, institutions are just too afraid to even go near it after what happened to the Walker, at the Walker Center and the NEA as a result of controversies related to that. I'm trying to imagine these things as all kind of related to each other and, um, and, um, and it's something that actually needs to start being talked about and addressed. Questions from the audience? Hi, I had a question for Jennifer um, about the, the film Fire in My Belly. I was wondering, uh, related to your thesis, if there was something the Catholic League knows about this video that maybe we don't. Um, and uh, I, was, I was at a Planned Parenthood demonstration the other day. And um, as you know, the, the Catholic Church re very often barricades the clinics and stuff, and we're spying on them back. And I had my Hispanic husband pick up a pamphlet from them, and it was actually a pamphlet about how the Catholic Church should kick out 
uh, the Mexican church for displaying indigenous practices within the church. And when I see that video, I notice that most of it is shot in Mexico. And I'm wondering if he was making an anti-imperialist statement also that um, I was, I wanted you to address that. And I also have an announcement. Um, on Monday, January 31st at 1 p.m. at the Smithsonian Metro Stop Mall entrance, Art Positive is having a protest. We're protesting the censorship at the Smithsonian and we're telling the Board of Regents that Clo must go. So if you could answer my first question, thank you. I really did, I started working on him before all this stuff happened, so it's like this kind of funny, because you know, the, his lawsuit against the American Family Association, it's a, one of, it's a really important lawsuit um, with regards to artist rights um, and um, the controversies that he um, found, you know, the, situ the battles that he took on during his life were phenomenal and important and, and uh, so much more overwhelming in terms of when you start to think about what he was doing as an individual than what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about, you know, large institutions and fully empowered people within respectable cultural institutions kind of arguing amongst each other, right, about um, um, this work by an artist who's no longer with us. In his life, in his life, he took on this fight about the, uh, uh, the misrepresentation and circulation of images from his work, which, um, and the resolution of that lawsuit impacts every single artist, you know, working within the United States today. Um, he's a pretty amazing person in terms of his understanding of his um, work, artwork and practice as a kind of activism. Kiki Smith in an interview actually said that I work with the body and he worked with experience. And that was a difference between us, which I'm still kind of meditating mm. on because I think it's really smart. Yeah. That's not a direct response to your question. I have no idea. I don't, I try, I don't try not to think about people <coughs> like that. It's a Catholic fundamentalist group. It's not even, a, it's not a representation of the Catholic church, the group that protested the fire in the, my belly. I mean, what I would be interested in is a conversation with people working within Catholic organizations about the long history within Catholic organizations and Catholic culture of a deep interrogation of, um, of, of Catholic iconography. That's, that's what Catholicism was about. That's what I remember from my Catholic school education, right, was Passions of the Christ and sitting there and being like, oh my God, that's really sexy and kind of, <laughs> oh, you know, like <laughs> that's how I remember Catholicism, right? And then like the, the lesbian sadomasochism of the girls sitting next to me, like kind of pinching me if I would turn around to try to see the nun playing the organ in the back. Um, Warner Rovich was also, you know, he had ca massive Catholic school damage, you know, and, um, um, and not something to joke about either that, you know, like he really, he had a biographical, you know, uh, direct reason to actually have a lot of um, 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 anger uh, and um, about institutional religion, you know, which also was about, which became about the Catholic, Catholic Church's stand on condom use. Um, that's what that's what, why those images are there, right? Um, and yes, it's absolutely related to colonialism, imperialism, you know, the, the myth of the one tribe nation. I mean, that was uh, um, um, a, his line, a, a theme that repeated across his work, this kind of myth of the one tribe nation. I mean, what does that mean, right? If not the, the horrific genocidal um, legacy, right, of um, the colonization of the Americas, right? I mean, uh, all of that stuff is deeply intertwined in his work, and it's the thing that makes his work so damn hard to talk about. You hardly ever see museum displays of the textual, textually dense works, because it takes so, they're like the videos, you know? Nobody wants to sit there and look at this canvas and try to read all that, right, and then figure out, you know, like America has a problem with death, that's another work um, where it's just like this amazing essay you know, um, and I, they're wonderful works, but they're, they're hard to curate and hard to work with because it's like going to school, right? Um, or in another context, you could say, like going to church. Um, it's, 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 it's um, um, a, his work is a critical practice and it's very demanding of its spectator. So it's a loop-de-loop -loop around what you asked, but um, I think I sort of got sort of in the neighborhood of it. And if I could just add one other thing, just on this point, which is simply that he was profoundly moved by Peter Hujar's photos in Mexico. And um, as a result, when he had uh, the desire to make a film, he went to Mexico, in fact, went to the very cemetery that Hujar had gone to and, um, and found particularly Mexican culture's um, awareness of and thematization of death as part of life, which of course the Day of the Dead is, is 
about um, compelling, especially uh, later on. Again, uh, because this event is being documented, could you state what the Catholic Church's position was on condoms yeah. at the time that David Warner Robich was speaking? That you'd basically go to hell if you used a condom. It was like against, I mean. So, so at, at, at the time yeah. that David was in the streets along with ACT UP, demanding that people get educated in the schools, that people were taught condom use, um, that was something that the Catholic Church and was actively. And the stance is only marginally better now. Can, can I, can yeah. I just add yeah. though, to, to, I, yeah. I, I want to make the point that not only was the Catholic Church opposed in general to the use of condoms, but, and I can sp speak from personal experience with this in San Francisco, th th not as a Catholic, <laughs> um, they fought the um, distribution of condoms in public schools. Yeah. They did. At a moment that we were very much trying to get condoms into public schools yeah. um, and yet um, articulated a pro-life stance. Sure. And you may know that that policy stands today in the New York City schools. Condoms are not taught. Prevention is not taught in the city school system. So it hasn't changed. Uh, so how do we redress the silence? Mm. <laughs> Anybody? How do we address the silence? How do we redress the silence if we were to just be, if we look at the, at the, at the uh, parentheses, we would be very... Well, I, th I think that one of the things that, I, I, I was just in love with what Chris Reed did. Um, and what Chris Reed did was, um, was beautifully integrate an account of biography, of social history, of theoretical engagement, towards bringing to, bringing to bear new facets. I'd seen those Tobys for a very long time and white writing was very familiar to me. But I, I remember early on in my education seeing Peter Seitz's book on the early abstract expressionist which includes Toby. And then nobody ever talks about Toby again in terms of abstract expressionism. And so something happened and I think Chris, thank you for making clear the degree to which sexuality informs that work and is available to us, but had never been quite articulated. I think what we have to do, and I think this exhibition and this conference is in part born of this, is to cross the divide from knowledge to acknowledgement. Um, it's not actually that we haven't known much of what we're talking about. It is that we haven't acknowledged it. It is that we haven't articulated it. It may not be um, known in the sense that it hasn't been spoken, but people feel things, and we're beginning, I think, finally to, to make that clear. Um, yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> yeah, Chris right, so was actually uh, wanted to say something about Chris. Oh, it's his work. It's his work. <laughs> Although she could say something about me, too. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, very, very nice of you. And I, I want to, um, I don't know, I want to make an attempt at a sort of big thought here. So this doesn't always go well, but I'm going to do my best. Um, because I think there are lots of ways to redress the silences and ways that different people um, need to do that. And I mean, you have a wad of art historians and one ambivalent ex-art historian and film and cultural history people um, here. And, and one of the remarks that David just made um, really struck home with me is I had a hunch, you know, and, and I feel like that's a kind of silence, like you see a work of art and you have a hunch, and then there's work to do. There's work to do to articulate why you had that hunch and what that hunch might look like and how that hunch might be meaningful to other people. Um, and that's a way of, of uh, redressing the silence, of kind of moving those inarticulate moments into articulateness. And, and I'm connecting it to Jonathan's question, Jonathan Weinberg, about Foucault and Baft, because I think that's such, I mean, I think it's a really interesting point about the ways that biography works, and we've seen that in some of the questions today, you know, um, this kind of, is it necessary to look at the way, at the art the way we're looking at it? No, it isn't necessary 
in that it's not inevitable, but it's necessary in that it is necessary for us. It is necessary as readers. And of course, for both Foucault and Bach, that was the point of the death of the author. It was the birth of the reader, the birth of the looker, the way to articulate forms of, um, forms of visual experience in the world, you know, kind of incoming and, and connect them to the things that are important um, to us. And of course, for artists, there's, you know, it's kind of outgoing. It's, it's, a, it's a, a way of developing and articulating languages that will make sense to people. Um, and, you know, which is why I think it's so important. Um, I don't think Josh, uh, who asked the question about Mondrian and, and uh, Judd is here anymore, so I'll just, you know, smack him around in his absence. It's so not important to connect it to those people because their agendas and their passions are not our agendas and our passions. Um, it's, you know, artists are working in particular um, contexts of, of conversation, visual and verbal conversation, and so are we. And it's important to defend the opportunities to have those conversations, which is why what's going on here is so important, and to articulate what those conversations look like. So there's a job for artists, and there's a job for those of us who describe uh, what we see. Okay, that was, that was my attempt. Damn. <laughs> there's no more. <laughs> opportunity to speak much today. Um, the, the one text that I really, again, that, that struck me and a, as kind of a bit of an outsider to this conversation was the John Cage and walking through Seattle and having a 20 minute walk take two hours because, in, in, and then the little funny poem about how the necessity to look and look again. And one of the things I'd made a joke earlier about my, my Peel book and how it would have been enhanced if I had done this show first. Um, and, and, and I was joking, but as Freud said, jokes are always true. Um, and that element of looking and looking again and looking anew, that element of, of being open or being receptive, going back to a kind of Whitman or Emersonian all-seeing eye, which, which encompasses the world and recreates it for us. I think that that's in the very act of either scholarly or artistic creation, I think that that's where you redress the silence, that sense that that, uh, although the last talk was on death, that even in that element of death that you learn anew about life and, and creativity. It's certainly what I've taken away from this, the fact that even you know, in the kind of routinized life of a museum academic and bureaucrat, that you can, you can think again about things that you think you know and find new ways of, of knowing them and new ways of expressing that knowledge. Yeah. Hi, I'm Peter Kramer, and uh, I just, um, given the fact that most of you are all here speaking of artists that are deceased, um, in the sense that you had this opportunity to, to speak directly for the loss of a, a public voice, um, was there anything between your group, and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot or anything, but was there anything within the group of all of you knowing that you are coming together at this conference, that together you may have made some sort of a public statement in relationship to the censorship of Wernerovich. I'll start with that. I, I do have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, and my position uh, about the the retaliative strategies um, that have been leveled at the Smithsonian is um, already more or less a matter of public record. And what I feel um, and what I felt in um, organizing my thoughts to come here is that the um, appropriate target for retaliative strategies, boycotts, um, and um, uh, demonstrations is uh, the religious right, the new right majority in um, the seat of government, and not the institution that labored when most of our uh, museums, private and public, across the country have not responded positively to decades of proposals to um, make the kinds of connections that this exhibition makes and generate the kinds of conversation uh, that, that the forum that this exhibition, multiple forums, has, uh, 
has opened up, including this afternoon. Um, and that when I was thinking about whether our papers would, or mine in particular, how my paper might address um, the issue of censorship, um, that's always been an issue. It's been a formative issue in my intellectual development and my development as a, as a, as a person in the United States and a queer person and as a pedagogue. Um, so I, I just had to trust that um, the, my political commitments are uh, saturate whatever I do and think. And um, sometimes it's explicit and sometimes it's implicit, but I come here really with a lot of gratitude to, to, to all of you and to, um, to you and to the institution that's, that's, uh, that's given us this platform. Um, and I, I think we deserve it. It's not, you know, uh, it's, it's not uh, hu humility really, but I think it's, it's, it's quite exceptional and, and, and warrants this acknowledgement. I think on the other hand, that the kind of viral um, uh, uh, rash of responses that have erupted in various other institutions all over the country, specifically addressing the censorship of Wojnarowicz, specifically making the piece available for discussion um, and um, uh, the, the animation of the conversation, anti-censorship uh, conversations around the country that, that, that the uh, withdrawal of the piece from the show, tragic withdrawal of the piece from the show has provoked um, is a, a fabulous example of the Foucauldian reverse discourse in that um, the very thing that's being suppressed is receiving so much more attention in, in, in this way, and I think that's fantastic, and I think that's in very appropriate, but that it's also very appropriate to create uh, a space for the, the, the scholarship that this uh, show has provoked and drawn on, that that also has its place, and that it need not necessarily be uh, um, a one pony show, mm -hmm. um, that it need not necessarily be uh, relegated to some kind of um, uh, less, uh, a, a lesser priority because there's, there are also those censorship issues to, th to think about. And I don't think that participating in one, uh, one form of, of, of activism, curatorial or uh, academic, um, uh, or pedagogical, it, it precludes um, some, some form of commitment to other forms of activism. And it's a question of where is the appropriate place and what is the appropriate time. And I'm very supportive um, of, uh, of, of keeping uh, the, the dialogues and um, energies on, uh, on track and, and, and making sure that the real, uh, the real deserving targets feel the impact of, um, of our anger. to put this on the microphone and into the record that he's he's um, asking that we all thank the David Warnerovich's estate and PPOW for facilitating the circulation and distribution of that work, um, which uh, is something I totally agree with. Yeah. And, um, I also want to, I want to just sort of like, I actually participated in a wonderful book. I have like the afterword in it, but the, the actual beat of the book is really fascinating. Um, it's called David Warnerovich, um, a, a Brief History of uh, Four or Five Years in the Lower East Side and it's interviews with people who collaborated with him, and it's really in, in detail discussions of his lawsuit against the American Family Association, the production of, of the works that are actually on, still on display, Fire in My Belly, um, It's So FOMO, it's everybody who's involved with all of these things is in there in really rich detail, um, and, um, and uh, uh, it was a work of love on beha behind the scenes of the publishers of Semiotext. Um, of a man named Eddie El Colti, who's a fantastic editor, but um, um, who made that happen um, because it's a, it's a really important um, a, 
um, collection of, of, of material and information about Warner Rovich and his circle. Um, and, um, and you don't have to travel to an archive in order to at least start to figure out and orient yourself in relationship to the subject. That's a plug. I just want to go ahead. Sorry. Um, to the gentleman of the flowered shirt, um, we address, readdress the silence every, in the way we live, to live honestly, to find any connection that we can with people, though it's impossible. And I come from this thinking in terms of issues of abortion rights. There's just, at some point, there may be no points where we connect, but screaming at each other is not going to help. There's commonalities and bonds and experience you'd be surprised at finding when we look for it. I think also, I had read somewhere, if you really want to affect change, you look at your media community, you look at school boards. We need to stop just talking in here. I don't mean that in a snotty way but to each other, and maybe this comes from, I'm gonna like, this is the last taboo you're supposed to say in a professional context, but as a mom, okay, who got from Jonathan the sissy duckling when the kids were born and pink outfits for my son and look at the curriculum kids are learning. If kids are still learning, about Henry Ford as the great car maker, and they don't mention that he was a supporter of Hitler and published the Elders of Zion, question that. If the churches, the mission churches in California are still being taught as these beautiful works of architecture where they were, and they don't mention that the Indians who were slaughtered when they would not acknowledge Christ, talk about it. And I came, I come a little, I'm from New York, but I live in a community which is very academic in California, and we questioned the practice of having kids dress up like Native Americans and paper bags, you know, fake stuff, and it went viral. This little community, and we're getting Fox News and such, and it was horrible, but you find any moment, you look at your libraries, you look at what you're talking about and take it in moderation and take it in steps. Okay, now, so now I'm going to be like the bad egg. No, no, I just... Okay, but this will... We have three, que we have three, rem we have three questions, I'm sorry, but I, I do want the audience to ask the last several questions, so we're going to go to Andre and then over there. Thank you again. I think I'm about to do something very, very stupid, but I'm going to do it anyway, which is defend, uh, defend Josh and his point for just another second. And it, it was not, um, I, I don't think what Josh was after was to sort of bring the canon back into this discussion. I think that was not what he wanted to do. But what he wanted to point the panel to, which I would love uh, you to address, was what <laughs> happened in the conversations today to the uh, uh, to the impulse to be normal within, uh, within a queer aesthetic and how it reappeared, what kind of models it latched on to, and so on and so forth. And I don't think that's, an, uh, that's a reinstitutionalization of canonic art when we want to compare um, of certain abstractions to others. And, or if, say, if we take uh, Jennifer's last really powerful um, uh, paper and sort of asked her to say, uh, how does Wojnarowicz fit in if we compared him to Otto Dix or John Hartfield and the kind of an early, earlier moments of difficulty in, um, in, in, uh, in our experiences with, with the visual object. Because what, what occurs then is um, uh, that the that Quickly, the I start with Thomas Aikens in the book. I, no, 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 I'm not. Um, all I wanted to say is that in the, the choices that, that queer artists make in um, uh, from the canon and so on, also do something to the canon, and they they kind of show that they are uh, that their impulse is already in there and so on. So I would love the panel to um, uh, to to go back a little bit to that problem, which is also a central problem of the exhibition. I, I, I as I gather. Uh, 
I just say something about just about my own work in, in that sense? Um, the, my work on Jess and Duncan entirely comes out of looking at Stan Brakhage's films, um, showing his own domestic interiors, which are um, built around really kind of hyperbolic ideas of heterosexuality, um, but ways in which he was trying to sort of make a new way of living um, at, at mid-century. Um, and that's entirely really why I was looking at Jess and Duncan, was to try and think of new ways of looking at, at, at something which had been massively critiqued, by, by, particularly by feminism, um, as being something um, patriarchal, I mean, unquestioningly patriarchal, and trying to look at this from another angle. So it, it certainly is a, a, a massive element of, of why I, I do this research, is to look back at um, you know, a, a heterosexual canon. two questions in, so we'll go over there. And I see the security guard in the back, so we're going to do two, and then we'll allow now. Um, I suppose this question is more towards uh, Jonathan and David, but uh, feel free for anybody to answer. Um, we already talked about what art historians can do and what artists can, artists can do. Um, but in terms of museum professionals, whether they be curators or collections managers who admire the show and want to do something like it. <laughs> Any advice? Um, I know sure. it's very general, but. Here, the, the one question that I've gotten, and um, this show received unrivaled unanimous support by everybody that we pitched it to from the, the director, Mark Pactor, and then the subsequent director, Marty Sullivan. The problem with this was that um, it is, Clausewitz said no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, that there was a Smithsonian plan. And then we were, the enemy arrived and everybody jumped out the window and started running around like chickens in a thunderstorm. And it, the, our, the best laid plan, I'll mix a few more metaphors, the best, <laughs> the best laid plans you know, just went completely crazy. Um, there is a problem, or it's not a problem, it's just the, the the situation with the Smithsonian being a federal entity um, compounds many of the other problems. I did an interview last month with Patty, a public interview with Patty Smith, and somebody asked her, you know, how do you succeed and all the rest of it? And I would give, paraphrase her answer, you do your work. You do your work as best you can. You don't sell out. You don't undercut. You don't assume failure. You don't trim. You don't self-censor. Um, and you do your work and you let the chips fall where they may, and then you fight the battle again. But, but, I, but I also, I, I, I do want to speak specifically to the, to the larger museum context, not this museum's, as, as I think your question was getting at, but the larger museological context. Um, and, and, and note that, um, that this was a hard exhibition to put together. There were some shining heroes, and there were some craven voices. Um, and there were people who actually said things like, you know, when I would ask to borrow work, don't put me in that position. Um, and I think there are a couple of things to note, but I think the most central is this, that increasingly the American Museum has become a highly privatized space um, in which essentially big capital comes to dominate. And of course, by that I mean not only the boards of trustees, but the art market itself. And um, as the idea of public service and uninvested examination of the historical record begins to recede in the face of this onslaught, um, we are seeing increasingly exhibitions drawn from trustees collections, trustees dictating what's going on. And so what we've seen really is this fundamental transformation of the museum in which the museum is still being credited with the kind of cutting edge, daring, experimental um, aura that it once perhaps held, but is now um, merely an extension in many respects of corporate culture. Um, and so until we make, we audience, make noise to take back our museums and to call out institutions that are in bed with corporate culture, um, then we will have lost the museum itself. 
Can I just, just say something? But also, we're, I think we're also fighting another thing which we really haven't talked about today, which is, uh, but we all, at least I feel very much oppressed by both as an artist and, a, and an art historian, is uh, an academic world which in a strange way, using some of the rhetoric of death of the author and et cetera, et cetera, has discounted a lot of the work that we, we do. So it's been this strange combining from what you might call the left, strangely enough, a lot of contemporary art curators, et cetera, et cetera, feel that to work on issues of queerness, et cetera, et cetera, is to uh, fall back on the biography or to fall back on some old essentialist ideas of identity, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so we get it from both ends in, 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 in essence. And so many university uh, departments look down on the kind of work because they characterize it as being under theorized or et cetera, et cetera you know, I keep saying et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's a strange combining of uh, corporate interests, uh, the interests of the closet that is still going on in, a, in an extraordinary way. Jonathan, in, in some ways I think you're being naive that we ever had the museums. It was museums and society starting from, okay, this is the historian's National Academy of Design in 1805. Frick established a museum. Rockefeller established a museum. It has always been the purview of the elite and the money talking down to the people. The only time it started to change was in the 1930s. And if you want to see change, and it's amazing. This is at the National Portrait Gallery, okay? The, the American Studies person to me still can't, it's mind blowing, okay? It was the only point of conversation I had with my across the street neighbors who are Mormon and we had battles of lawn signs going on. Go to the community art centers. Go to the colleges. That's where the daring is. If you want to see progressive work, if you want to see new work, and sometimes you have to, I've never heard the word aesthetic used so much today as maybe because I'm in American art and we can't talk about it <laughs> pre-45. Go, go to those places, okay? It's incredible that this is happening here, but we never look at the board of the Metropolitan, okay? I, again, I, th I just want to get to the last question and then we're going to close. So we have seven minutes. I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah. My name is Allison Maurer. I, um, along with my collaborator, Julia Haas, started uh, hideseek.org, and um, we are here and really excited to be here. But I wanted to bring attention to the fact that I guess when we started the site, we knew that to a degree it was going to be somewhat of a privileged space, that the people that were going to go to the site were going to be people that had an idea of what was going on and that were looking for more information. And our intention for it to be an archive is for people who want to research this, that they will have access to all of the information about everything that's gone on. This is also a privileged space. You know, the people that are here are people that are excited about this exhibition, that, you know, are, are scholars, know a lot about art history, queer studies, cultural studies. Um, what I'm sort of wondering is this, this next step of taking it to the people that aren't privileged to this information already. Um, and I think that's something that we're thinking about as the exhibition is you know, nearing its end date, um, where we go from here. Tirza, I'm really excited to hear more about the, the Gertrude Stein exhibition, that there are more things that are happening. Um, but in order to, to sort of keep the momentum going, I feel like it needs the momentum of people that aren't just the privileged scholarly few. And I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts about sort of, and I know you, Diane, you mentioned getting it out to community centers, but I'm, I'm really curious how to keep everyone else's interest peaked in this, if anybody has any thoughts. Well, to be honest, I'm not sure that you can continue to keep everybody's interest peaked on this one issue. I think that the issue of archival I guess more no, I mean no, like... No, I know, I know what you mean. I'm just what I'm saying is there needs yeah. to be a next wave. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, picking up on the, the art world that Jonathan described, while we, when we attempted to travel this show, we got no takers. Now that we're um, a hit, we've got people saying, oh, we'd like, can hide seek come to X in 2012? And I look at the phone and I go, no. Where were you in 20, you know, 2009? So I think there's the element of the next show, whether it's Jonathan's aid show at Tacoma, the work that you can do, 
Um, specific to hide seek, one of the things, although she's left now, Patty Stonecipher, who's the chairman of the Smithsonian Regents, was here practically the entire day, and she gave us a, a, a big grant to beef up the website for hide seek, so it'll be an exhibition in perpetuity, be the first NPG virtual exhibition. We're very pleased about that. But I think there's now the element, as Diana said, not just going out into the community to look at the art center, but going out into the community to do art and activism. But it's gonna be the next wave, not hide seek part five, and we're not doing Rocky here. <laughs> and, and, and I do think it's important to note that that the next five years are really going to be defining. If, if we can get other queer exhibitions going within that window, then I think we'll have successfully dislodged the blacklist that kept exhibitions such as this one from happening for so very, very long. Um, it, it's imperative that all of us um, start making noise uh, about the necessity of these kinds of exhibitions across the country. Um, and the quicker we get other ones up, the better it will be for us all. Um, no, no, I've always allowed, uh, the last four years I've allowed Jonathan always to have the last word. <laughs> he, gets, he gets the last word today. I want to again thank the J.B. Harder Foundation for their support. I want to thank all of the panelists, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Thanks a lot. <laughs>